عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا بعثه الله رحمة للعالمين نصلي عليه في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي الملأ الأعلى يا رب العالمين أصيكم نفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل كما جاء في محكم التنزيل يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا Brothers and sisters, we begin with praise and gratitude. Our beloved, nourishing, nurturing provider and sustainer has given us this life, this gift that we live. And we are responsible to show some gratitude. And that is the whole reality of Islam, is the revelation that nurtures and nourishes that natural disposition we have to look and seek for our Lord and Creator and Provider and to live a life of servitude and worship reflecting the light of His beautiful creative truth to the world. I wanted to reflect in the Prophet Wasallam's biography as it relates to other Prophet's biographies, as it relates to how the Qur'an comes in to intervene in our lives if we are conscious of it, if we are recognizing the divine plan. So it was after the Battle of Uhud in which the Quraysh had gathered a large army of 3,000 plus soldiers to go destroy Islam and its Prophet. So these Quraysh come from Mecca and they come to the outskirts of Medina where the mountain of Uhud is and the Muslims went out. And unfortunately this was a very disastrous reality, perhaps in terms of the Prophet's own physical reality, the most serious harm that had befallen the Prophet ﷺ. According to the narrations, the Prophet ﷺ left the sad loss of Uhud with a broken jaw, a torn cheek, lost teeth, his leg was wounded and his side was gashed and he was bleeding. It was in that battle that people said that, you know, he has died looking at him from afar. And so he comes back home to his beloved wife Aisha radiallahu anha, may God be pleased with her. And he's, you know, very distressed. And so Aisha says, this must be the worst day that you've ever been through in your life. And the Prophet wasallam said, no, actually, um, thinking back, this is not the worst day that I have faced in my life. And so the Prophet wasallam then went on to say, uh, I can remember vividly the worst day was after the death of his beloved uncle who passed away on disbelief after many years of supporting and taking care of the welfare of the Prophet and putting his neck out for him. And then three months after that, while the Prophet is going through وسلم, worse abuse and double the danger and threat because now there is no political asylum that he has, then his wife died his beloved wife of many years, Khadija radiallahu anha. So the Prophet sallallahu is completely broken. And then Abu Bakr, a lot of people don't realize this happened at the same time, was disowned amongst Quraysh and was finding himself leaving to Ethiopia for the first time. And so the Prophet sallallahu was there and who does he have? Zayd ibn Muhammad, as he was known at that time. His adopted son Zayd. He said, Zayd, we have to go somewhere to find some solace and some safety and try to arrange some sort of uh, welfare for the Muslims, some sort of protective care. So he resolved to take his uh, adopted son Zayd to the city of Ta'if. And he went to Ta'if and it was a strategic meeting. He went there to specifically meet with the elders and the tribe, tribal heads to somehow arrange some sort of treaty or diplomacy of asylum for the Muslims. And the first concern was, if you will just let people know in Quraysh, because there was a tahalif, there was an alliance between the people of Ta'if and the Quraysh. Ta'if being just south of Mecca, some short distance. 
And so they were not listening to any of that, and then they even went further when the Prophet ﷺ suggested that maybe the Muslims would migrate there. So after 10 days of trying to have private meetings, these people, and the Prophet ﷺ said, look, I'm just a man in a very tough situation coming to you to see what we can arrange. But these people, not only did they not respect his privacy, they went around mocking him in front of people. And people were mocking the Prophet Sallallahu and Zayd, and they were cursing them. And then on the 10th day, they told them, they said, you know, run these fools out of our city. And so they went throwing rocks at the Prophet Sallallahu and Zayd. And so they're going out, and according to the narration, the Prophet Sallallahu has bruises, and his legs have some scratches and scrapes on them. So according to the story, they go a few miles uh, out towards Mecca and there is a big orchard uh, garden there that is owned by Utbah ibn Rabi'ah who is a alliance with the Quraysh and so the Prophet Sallallahu and uh, Zayd they took rest under the tree and the hadith says لم استفق حتى وصلت إلى البستان and so he says I didn't even come to my senses after what I had been through in Ta'if and being mocked and humiliated and ridiculed and treated like an absolute fool. And so he said he came to that tree and he sat down to rest with Zayd and then it overwhelmed him. And there are some scholars who debated the authenticity, but there are scholars that said since it's been narrated by a few different people with very similar language that this is a fa famous prayer that you have probably all heard in which the Prophet Sallallahu opened his heart and let it out under that tree. So he puts his hand up as was the way of the Prophet وسلم, He used to pray as it says, and we would see the whiteness of his armpit. You know? I don't know some people doing this one. I don't know if that's exactly how the Prophet وسلم, was doing it. I don't know any narration. Prophet وسلم, was calling out. He would pray like this. He's opening his hands to the heavens, calling out to his Lord. And so I don't know about this one either. <laughs> The Prophet ﷺ is doing like this. He's calling to the most powerful on most high, who sees and hears and knows all things and has the ability and the power over all things, the omnipotent one. So he says, Oh God, I complain to you my weakness, my lack of ability, my insignificance with the people. Oh most merciful one, of all who show mercy. You are the nurturer of the weak and the helpless. My nurturer, who will you give authority over me? Will it be an unsympathetic, distant relative of mine? Or will you allow an enemy to have power and authority over me? The Prophet ﷺ says, as long as you are not displeased with me, I don't care what you have decreed for me, and I will take it as it comes. But if you are to pardon me, that would be most sufficient and comforting to me. I seek refuge from your displeasure with the light of your face that illuminates the darkness and makes wholesome all things in this world and the hereafter. I seek your pleasure and contentment and there is no power and no authority and no means except with God. So the Prophet وسلم, is pouring out his heart in a deep level of humility, in a deep level of servitude and need, and uh, just begging for the presence and the grace of Allah. And so at that moment, at that moment, if you read the seerah, that is when Utbah, who is with Ta'if against the Prophet وسلم, but he's looking at how he looks with his hands up probably cr crying. And he tells his servant, Abdas, who is a Christian man from Iraq, and he is the servant. He says, Abdas, here, take some of these grapes and go help those poor people there. So Utba, who is a polytheist, he's watching this event, and his heart is moved. And so then Abdas takes these grapes over to the Prophet ﷺ. The prayer is being answered and as we get to the end of this story, we will explain to you something you probably did not get through however many times you have heard this story. 
So the prayer is being answered as Utbah's heart, this polytheist, is touched and sends the grapes with his servant Abdas. So Abdas comes over there with the grapes and he says, Here, when we, we, my master Utbah saw you and he said, You know, please go ahead and eat from these grapes. So the Prophet thanked him and he said, Bismillah, in the name of God. And then he began to eat. And then Abdas, it says, he was moved and he said, Hold on. I have never heard anyone around here saying such a thing when they eat in the name of God. Where did you learn that from? And so the Prophet ﷺ said, this is how any believer would say. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, uh, where, who are you and where are you from? Meaning, you're saying no one from around here, maybe you've been somewhere else. He said, I'm from a place called Nineveh. It is in Iraq. And the Prophet ﷺ smiled and he said, Is that the place of the Prophet Jonah? And he said, And how would you know who the Prophet Jonah is? Because why the concept of prophethood and the historical prophets in Arabia is some weird thing. It would be like knowing the, the idols of the Hindus here. How many people would be able to tell you one? If not, you know, some old one that nobody really talks about, which Jonah is one of those prophets. And so then he said, well, actually, I'm the brother of Jonah, and we are prophets, and we are brothers in the message of God. And so Abdas was moved, and in one of the authentic narrations, he kissed the Prophet's forehead, he kissed, kissed his hand, and he began to kiss his feet. And Utbah is standing there with his brother, and he said, oh, that guy has done his magic on this Abdas now. You know, he has ruined your servant. And so then Abdas comes back and they said, what happened? What is wrong with you? Why would you be kissing some man like that? He said, this man that we just saw is better than anyone on this earth. We know of the prophets. I am a Christian man. He knows things that no one would know unless they were a prophet. And so the Prophet wasallam, he goes on. And as he's moving on, in some miles, then when he goes on, then uh, the angel comes to him. And so the angel comes with another angel. And he's telling him, look, what have the people done to you? Look at what you're going through. The answer to your prayers here, if you want, I will cause these two mountains to destroy these people. And the two mountains are around Mecca, not Taif. al Aqshabain are the mountains you see around Mecca, not Taif. A lot of people confuse that part of the story. And so the Prophet ﷺ thought about it for a moment and he said, no, please don't do that. I hope and I pray that God would guide the children of these misguided people to worship Him alone and to be His servants on this earth. And he saw that this is a very important moment. Because not only was it that a few years later when the Battle of Badr is about to happen and Utbah tells Abdas, we're going to fight that guy is now thinking he's powerful and he said, I will not fight even if it means I have to run away from you because that guy will win. You see what's happening here is Abdas and this story of Jonah has come right then. Imagine, think about the story of Jonah. You see, this is divine intervention. Can you imagine how many ayat and surah Yunus has been revealed before this time? Are you thinking the Prophet ﷺ was not seeing this divine sign? Because what happened with Jonah? What happened with Jonah? And what kind of sign is happening here in this random Christian? There are no Christians in Arabia. And he's from the city of Jonah. And there's very rarely a Christian amongst the Christians of the world from the city of Jonah. Who knows about this Jonah if he was from this city? Being that Jonah was a prophet that came many, many centuries before Jesus, peace be upon him. And they focus everything on Jesus. And so this story comes right here at this moment. When the Prophet ﷺ is in the belly of the whale going through the pain and suffering that his people has led him to. And he has left his people in Mecca. The story is divine providence. And so the Prophet ﷺ is thinking of all of these things that happened in the life of Jonah. And the Prophet ﷺ is reflecting in himself. And so rather than to be like Noah 
and answer yes, destroy them, he was like, maybe I will go back and at some point, if I work on this, the people will be like the people of Jonah. And what did happen was exactly that. Within 14 years, all of the people of Mecca are Muslim, exactly as he prayed, exactly as he was led to pray, because of being the one who first receives the Holy Quran and the stories of Jonah, as they enriched in him an attitude that led him to make the decision that he made in that moment. And that's what happens when you lead a life connected to the Holy Quran. That's what happens when you are affected by the Holy Quran. And so the Prophet ﷺ was very much enriched. And we have to see right now, we're in a great situation. No matter what laws they have made that affected us here, no matter what they're doing in Syria, what they are doing in Myanmar and China and Kashmir and Africa and elsewhere. Guess what? We are surrounded by the Christians. And when the Prophet ﷺ met Christians in Mecca, through all he went through, it was Waraka, the Christian, when he first met him, who gave him support and told him, don't worry, it's okay, you are the one. And then it was Najashi who also became Muslim, said, don't worry, it's okay, I know what you believe, I believe what you believe. And now here it is, the Christian in the Ta'if experience that reminded him of his book. So we are surrounded by people who will be our supporters and who will see the light of Islam and who will be touched by the light of Islam only if we follow the example of the Prophet ﷺ and not be like those who failed him in Uhud and be like those who supported him thereafter. So I ask Allah to guide us and be with us and enrich us with his books. <coughs> It should be that a believer is strategic and filled with optimism at the worst time. Only after we turn to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Only after. We should be filled with prayer every day. And when we pray, no matter what they're doing all over the world to destroy our religion and our people, we know who it is. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And that if we are seeking his support, and we are trying to follow his Quran, and we are connected to his example in our daily lives, strategically working. Because what did the Prophet Sallallahu do? Right after he left, he didn't just go back into Mecca and be killed because that was what was going to happen. He called many polytheists who he thought might help him. He called Suhail ibn Amr, he called Fulan ibn Illam, and they said, look, we're not going to help you. And he called Mut'im ibn Abi. A polytheist, Mut'im. And when we put the story together, we see that Mut'am is from uh, Bani Khuza'ah, who it was when the Quraysh later were treacherous against Hudaybiyah, it was through Khuza'ah that Fatah of Mecca came. Put the Susira together, it is a miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon divine aid. There is no other way of describing the Seerah of the Prophet it read intensely and deeply, not just for factoids of names and events and years, as many people teach it, but rather the essence of what it's all about, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Mutam al Adi, he gave the Prophet the protection so that they could plan what to do from there. And then their prayers were answered more when the people came from yesterday, the year later. And they met with the Prophet ﷺ, saying, you know, these Jews are telling us of this Prophet thing, and we were want to see, what do you know about that? Because the Jews are telling us in Yathrib that there will be this Prophet come, and they will become a powerful nation, and we will be their servants. So we want to see, are you that Prophet? And the Prophet talked to them and said, this, we think he is the Prophet. And then he begins to send 
Musa ibn Umayr and Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. The strategic people, people of knowledge and character and wisdom, not powerful nobles and all of that. And we see the success of the Prophet after this prayer. And it's not easy, and it will come with work, but we have to be steadfast. Surely those who say, our nurturer, our provider and sustainer is Allah. And then they sought to follow the straight path. Guide us to the straight path. A couple of ayahs later it says, Here's your Salat al Mustaqim. You're asking for. So I ask Allah, Ya Allah, we ask you to enrich us with your holy book. We ask you to forgive us for our laziness and for our weakness. We complain to you our own weakness and insignificance and inability. We know that you have all of the strength and all of the power and we seek the light of your face to fix and repair what is broken within us. That you may lead us to be a community who work together, struggling and striving in your sake, preparing for the ultimate meeting with you. Not concerned about material wealth and gain and material affiliation, but seeking a spiritual plane of growth and development that never ends in your bliss and in your peace and in your favor. Ya Allah, we ask you to make our community here a successful community of believers who lift up your word, who organize themselves to work for your cause and to build upon Islam in the United States of America.